Okay, well today we're going to look at prayers from the New Testament and also a little bit what the New Testament has to say about prayer. Before we do, I want to read uh, from Mark chapter 10. I think this is the gospel for next Sunday. And for me, uh, above anything else in the New Testament, it kind of lays out the groundwork of what prayer is all about, kind of sums it up very nicely. So this is the story of blind Bartimaeus. Mark 10, beginning in verse 46. They came to Jericho, and as Jesus was going from Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus, the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many were sternly telling him to be quiet, but he kept crying out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, arise, he's calling for you. And casting aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus. And answering him, Jesus said, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, or teacher, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and began to follow him on the road. So this is really, above anything else, the origin of what we call the Jesus Prayer, very prominent in Eastern Orthodox spirituality. Um, and I suppose why it was sort of latched on to is it's so simple, so direct, so short. And Paul, of course, talks about the, uh, the goal of uh, praying without ceasing, praying constantly, and uh, so this is kind of a good tool to latch on to as a prayer to say constantly. So the idea is that you sort of practice saying this one little prayer um, perpetually. And um, Son of David, have mercy on me is, to my mind, kind of the, the underlying sentiment of all prayer. Because you're addressing Jesus, who has the right to intercede with us to the Father, and you're asking for mercy. And basically, anytime you ask for anything in a prayer, you're asking for mercy. You're asking for better than what you deserve. So we don't deserve these things. That's why, especially, we're asking for them. Well, let's look at our handout. And we don't have, ev like, like just last time, we don't have every uh, prayer uh, in the New Testament. But we do have some of the highlights. And also, as we mentioned, some of the verses that are about prayer. And there's some differences between last time when we talked about the prayers of the Old Testament. So while prayers of the Old Testament tend to focus more on temporal requests, prayers of the New Testament tend to focus more on spiritual requests or on healing. The New Testament also introduces the idea of praying to the Father through the Son. So the Messiah fulfills the Old Testament sacrifices with the offering of himself and opens up the gates of heaven, symbolized in the earthquake that rent the veil of the temple in twain at Jesus' death. Another advancement is the promise of the Son to intercede with the Father on our behalf as our mediator and advocate. And so Jesus himself said, I pray to the Father for you. And we have, the New Testament talks about several kind of precepts of prayer when it comes to Jesus and the things that he had to say about it. Number one, sincerity. Um, so we want sincerity as opposed to the hypocrisy that we find in the prayer of the Pharisees. We want to pray in spirit, we want to pray in truth, and we want to pray earnestly and genuinely. Number two is humility, and that kind of goes hand in hand. We have that famous uh, lesson or a parable about the publican and the Pharisee, um, whereas the Pharisee, you know, I love how it says he prayed with himself. It's almost, you know, he was the only one who really wanted to listen anyway. <laughs> and then the publican was just uh, very humble and beating his breast and saying, much like blind Bartimaeus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Number three, pray with repentance. Turning back to God is the essence of prayer. And so you'll find that in the liturgies of the church, they almost always begin with some type of expression of humility and confession. Number four, obedience. 
God heeds the prayers of those who seek to do his will. So God is not really interested in answering the prayers of those who are not coming to him in a genuine, humble way and are not seeking to do his will. You know, you can just take that somewhere else. Number five, faith. Belief in God is a prerequisite for God to grant such requests. And that would make sense. It was almost go without saying because if you don't have faith in God, why are you asking him for anything in the first place? You know, if you don't really believe in him, if you don't think that he would heed anything you have to say, um, why are you praying to him? But it's strange. In surveys that are done again and again, what we find, at least in America, is that a higher percentage of people say they pray than say they really believe in God. So you have like uh, 80% say they pray and 70% say they believe in God. Now you do have forms of prayer from other traditions, Eastern uh, mysticism and Buddhism and stuff like that, where you don't necessarily have to believe in a personal God, but prayer is more of a spiritual exercise that you can kind of basically just do with and for yourself. So that may account for the discrepancy of figures. Number six, forgiveness. Jesus stressed that only those who forgive others will be forgiven by God. So if you're praying to God for forgiveness, remember that you have to be willing to forgive others as well. Number seven, fasting. There's, so there's a certain intensity, certain power that's added to our intercessions through this penance of fasting. So then that's, not, that's not a prerequisite for all prayer, but it does come up again and again as a useful tool. Number eight, persistence. So Jesus often talked about the value of prayerful determination, perseverance, nagging God, like the lady who nagged the judge to get what she wanted. Number nine, privacy. This is not one we really think about very often. So he talks about the, in that Ash Wednesday gospel that we get, praying behind closed doors. Again, it's kind of going back to some of those earlier examples in contrast to those who pray at the street corners just so they can be seen by men. Number 10, in accordance with the divine will. So God is always going to address our prayers, answer our prayers, grant us requests according to what he believes is good and right and true. Number 11, praying in the divine name. So that's one of the things that was new and unique with Jesus. There's not a whole lot when you look at the teachings of Jesus, there's hardly anything really that's new, that's innovative. It's all just traditional Jewish teaching. But this is one element that's new because of his own dynamic coming into the situation, that the way to the Father is through the Son. That's why God came down from heaven to be incarnate. And number 12, praying in the power of the Spirit. So he helps us in our weakness and prays through us. So let's look at some of those example prayers from the New Testament, kind of starting out uh, in the beginning of the Gospels. Now, Luke is not the first Gospel, but he, he gives us an earlier view into the story. So in Luke chapter 1, we find Zechariah praying in the temple, and his prayers are answered. Now, we don't get the text of his prayer, but we get the whole story of it. So Luke 5 one, beginning in verse 5, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God. So remember some of those precepts and criteria of prayer from Jesus. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. So it's interesting you get a double indication of impossibility. So it's not just that she's too old to have a child, but she's also been barren the whole time. So she can't have a child, and even if she could, it's too late anyway. You know. So while he was serving as a priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, it fell to him by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside 
at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Now let's pause there. What's interesting is we're not told what Zechariah was praying for. Or are we? So we don't get the text of Zechariah's prayer, but what we do get is the response from God saying, your prayer is answered, you'll have a son. So we can deduce from that that he was either explicitly praying for a son or that this is kind of a, something that's been on his heart for decades, you know, that at long last the time has come to grant that prayer that you may not have even thought about for the last 30 years, you know. But it's something that has been your prayer for a long time. And uh, it was granted in heaven, and now is the right moment for that to come into fruition. So verse 14, you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. He shall have no wine or strong drink, and will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Pause there. Here we have an example of someone praying to someone other than God. So he's talking to the angel. He's praying to the angel. Now just because the angel is in front of him and he's probably speaking out loud doesn't mean he's not praying. To pray in the wider sense is to communicate. I mean the word comes from the word ask, but the way we use the word prayer, it encompasses many other things than just asking. It can be praising, offering, uh, um, a gift, uh, and so on. In fact, we used to use the word um, in terms of asking more explicitly. Uh, Still in uh, legal briefs, there'll be a a closing segment called a prayer to the court. And it's it's not that the lawyers are getting down and, well, maybe they are (laughs) saying, please give us this. It's, this is what we're asking for. We're asking for this injunction or we're asking for this judgment or so on. So he's praying to the angel. How shall this be? I'm an old man. My wife is advanced in years. Verse 19, And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things come to pass, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they wondered at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak to them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he made signs to them and remained dumb. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. And then we pick up later in the story, his father Zechariah was uh, filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us, in the house of his servant David. And then that continues on, which is a canticle used at morning prayer. So we have the first big example of prayer in the gospel story. The big text of the prayer is the praise of Zechariah following the fulfillment of this blessing uh, mentioned by the angel Gabriel, that he would have a son. And of course, as we know in the story, his name is John, and that's what he indicated on the writing tablet. Then we have, following quickly on the heels of that, the story of Gabriel coming to visit Mary. So Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Hail, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Now we're more familiar with full of grace, which comes filtered through the Latin, gratia plena. 
And it, it, it's, it's something that's kind of hard to translate precisely from the Greek, and I think that gratia plena is a good summation of it. Um, highly favored um, is not inaccurate in any sense, um, but it's, it's, it's talking about the, the, the fullness of blessing, the fullness of God's favor. Um, and he says, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled and considered in her mind what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Um, now, it's interesting to think of this prayer or this response to prayer, although it, we don't get the same indication uh, that we do in the earlier story, that this is in response to a prayer. But perhaps it, it, it would make sense that Mary and Joseph um, are thinking about the future um, and thinking of God's purpose. Now, the situation is a little bit different with Mary because um, the non-canonical gospel tradition uh, tells us that she had been a consecrated virgin, uh, that she had vowed a perpetual vow of virginity. Um, it's, it's said that her parents were old and uh, that they, uh, in their declining years, uh, basically sent her to boarding school, which was the temple school, and uh, they trained up girls. It was a choir of virgins, but they didn't stay there perpetually. They kind of graduated and, and moved on. Uh, but her parents either had passed away or were, were too old to take care of her. They probably passed away, otherwise she would take care of them. But uh, the time came for her, you know, where is she going to go, what she's going to do. And so Joseph allegedly was a widower. And so oh, Joseph agrees to take her in. He's not interested in having a new family. But both of them, as prayerful people, are thinking about their future and what God has in store for them and how they might be faithful and, and uh, what life will be like and so on. So this could be in response to that general kind of prayer. But it's also, of course, in response to God's plan. And God always makes the first move, really, in any of our prayers. So verse uh, 32, Gabriel continues, talking about Jesus. He will be great, be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And Mary said to the angel, again, praying to an angel, how shall this be, since I have no husband? And that is the indication that she has this vow of virginity. Because I found it very hard to believe the idea that Mary doesn't know where babies come from. You know, so this angel says, uh, you're, going to have a, you're going to have a son. And she says, how can this be? I'm not married. I don't know how this works. Ordinarily, for any other couple, this would make sense, you know. We're getting married, we're gonna start a family. Angel comes and says, you're gonna have a son. There's no need to ponder, how, how does that possible? Everybody knows how that's possible. But if she has a vow of perpetual virginity that God has, she's made before God, God has accepted it, God has blessed it, then she's perplexed. Well, how can this be? I thought I was supposed to be a virgin for the rest of my life, and you're coming here and saying you're going to have a son. Am I supposed to break the vow of virginity? Or is, how is this supposed to work? So that's why she's perplexed. How shall this be, since I have no husband? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. So in other words, don't give up your vow. God has made special provision for this. Behold, and, and we know that that's an indication that this is supposed to be miraculous because he goes to refer to a miracle that's just happened. So he's making a comparison. Behold, your kinswoman Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. So again, Elizabeth, not only is she too old to have a child, she's also been barren the whole time. And yet God has worked a miracle God is going to work a miracle for you as well. And so he concludes, with God, nothing is impossible. And Mary said, behold, I am the Lord's servant. I am the handmaid of the Lord. 
Let it be according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So we have this prayerful interchange, and note that God speaks to Mary through the angel, and Mary speaks to God through the angel. So the angel is kind of an intermediary in this prayer scene. Mary responds later with her visit to Elizabeth. She sings her song of praise, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. As we mentioned last time, modeled after the song of praise and thanksgiving sung by Hannah, uh, who was the mother of uh, the prophet Samuel. We also get another little glimpse of a prayer situation in Luke chapter 2 with the shepherds and the angels. Luke 2, 13, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When, uh, oh, what was his name? I can't remember. It was, it was a local official who writes back to uh, the Emperor Trajan reporting on the Christians in Bithynia, I think. One of the little details he mentions in his report on them is that they meet together very early on Sunday morning and they sing a hymn to Christ as God. And we think that this is perhaps an early form of the Gloria that he is mentioning here, the song of the angels that came to be taken up and used in Christian worship. We get a glimpse of some of the prayer habits of Jesus. So we see, for example, in Mark 1, 35 and 6, 46, in the morning, a great while before day, he rose and went out to a lonely place, and there he prayed. And after they had taken leave of him, he went up on the mountain to pray. So some of the things we notice about Jesus' own prayer habits is that he seeks solitude. He seeks a time apart, away, a time of quiet, a time where he can be free of distractions of the world and be still and be at peace and uh, have that quiet time with God. And so a lot of, especially evangelicals, talk about their prayer time as quiet time, you know, and developing a quiet time discipline. Also in the first uh, account there, you note that he does this early in the morning before the day gets started. And that's a wise thing too, because uh, very often, if you, you know, if you plan to do something during the day, especially when it's prayer, which can be, you know, you can, you can put it off and you can put it off, and so before any distractions of the day come along, before any needs might take you away from that opportunity, he prioritizes it before the day gets started. I like in Matthew 7, beginning in verse 7, he talks about prayer is kind of this quest, as it were. Ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, it will be open. Or what man of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, notice he calls us evil, <laughs> which is strange. I mean, not theologically strange, but it's strange in the, in the sense of um, sort of being polite. <laughs> he 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 puts us in his place. Like, look, you corrupt people, you know that simple bit of wisdom. Why would you expect anything different when it comes to God? So if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And so the underlying message is, ask him. Ask, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened. And then in Luke 18, beginning in verse 1, he talks about a parable of prayer as persistence. He told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor regarded man, and there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, vindicate me against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will vindicate her, or she will wear me out by her continual coming. 
And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God vindicate his elect, who cry to him day and night? Will he lay long over them? I tell you, he will vindicate them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And in that context, I think he's referring to that exercise of faith in prayer. When the Son of Man comes, will he find anybody praying for him to come back? Will he find anybody asking and pleading God for the things uh, that God has in store for them? And then in Luke 18, he talks about uh, prayer as an act of humility. He told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up in the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and thus prayed with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing afar off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went justified to his house rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And when we focus specifically on the lesson for prayer, we might tweak that to say, everyone who humbles himself will be heard by God heeded by God, um, but those who exalt themselves, God's not going to pay attention to them, which is the same lesson that we get in other passages as well. And then again, uh, that value of uh, genuineness that we talked about earlier in Matthew 6, beginning in verse 5, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. They wanted to be seen. They got seen. They got what they were asking for. They weren't really asking for what they were talking about. They were just asking for being noticed. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And in praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Now, sometimes people pluck this verse out and, and use it as, um, as a tool to argue against praying things more than once, praying repetitiously, um, praying a litany, uh, or like the Eastern Orthodox praying that Jesus prayer. Um, like, well, you already said that. You don't have to say it again. But the emphasis here is empty phrases. So, yeah, I mean, you shouldn't pray an empty prayer one time, much less a hundred times. So the emphasis there is not on repetition. Jesus has already talked about repetition. He says, be like that widow who keeps coming to the judge again and again and again and keeps nagging him. There's nothing wrong with repetition. We want persistence. What we don't want is empty phrases. And that description, empty phrases, um, has a, a characteristic to it of Gentile worship of this kind of futile uh, worship, you know. The, the prayers that the Gentiles offer to a false god are hollow. You know, they have no real substance. They have no real value. A very interesting prayer in light of our study comes in Luke chapter 16. You'll notice a lot of this comes from Luke. Luke is very big on talking about prayer of all the four Gospels. This is, as it were, a prayer out of hell. So after uh, the story of a rich man and dives, or uh, dives and Lazarus, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom. So before we go on, a little bit of geography here. So what we have is, is Sheol in Hebrew, which is the abode of the dead. So everybody who's dead is in the abode of the dead. The Greek word for it is Hades. Now within Hades or Sheol, the abode of the dead, you have different places for the righteous and for the unrighteous. 
and there's a kind of a chasm in between. And he mentions that there, that there's no way across. You know, I can't go up there, you can't come down here. And so that is the scene. So they're both in hell, or the abode of the dead, and they're talking to each other. And notice, praying not to God, but to the saints. Father Abraham. This is verse 24. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue. So in other words, he's just asking for something very small, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he's comforted here, and you are in anguish. Besides all this, there is between you and us a great chasm that has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he says, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. We might say, in a sense, there's a chasm in that situation as well, a chasm between life and death. Now, with God's power, then that chasm could be transversed, but that's not the usual way that things happen. As Gabriel said, with God, all things are possible. And he said, um, or sorry, Abraham said, this is verse 29, well, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent, little foreshadowing about Jesus and the resurrection. He said to him, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. And then we have an example in Luke 22 of Jesus praying. And uh, it's interesting that he, 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 we don't get the text of his prayer to the Father so much as we get uh, kind of the overhearing of that petition when he relates it to Simon or Peter. Uh, Luke 22, beginning in verse 31, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brethren. So some interesting things to note there is that Jesus is praying for us, which kind of blows me away to think Jesus is praying for you what kind of things is he saying? What, what is he talking about? What, is, what are his petitions for you? And note this also, that he, when he talks about his petition for Peter, he talks about how it's going to be answered. It's going to be fulfilled. When you have turned again, not if, but when you have turned again in response to my petition, strengthen your brethren. Use that as an opportunity to build up others. Well, now let's talk about Jesus' high priestly prayer. And, um, you know, when we talk about the Lord's Prayer, perhaps we should really call it the Apostles' Prayer because the prayer uttered by the Lord is His high priestly prayer in John 17. So the different Gospels give us uh, pretty much parallel accounts of a lot of things, but one of the unique things about John is that it doesn't give us the familiar text of the Baptism and the Last Supper. He talks around them, he gives an analysis of them, but he doesn't give us the familiar words um, like, uh, this is my body, this is my blood. That doesn't come up in John, although it, he does talk about it in the Bread of Life discourse. But we get the scene painted much more vividly than in the other Gospels, except for those crucial words. He kind of paints around the center of the picture. And one of those things that we get is Jesus' high priestly prayer, which is basically uh, chapter 17. So when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that the Son may glorify thee, since thou hast given him power over all flesh to give eternal life to all those whom thou hast given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I glorified thee on earth, having accomplished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, Father, glorify thou me in thine own presence with the glory which I had with thee 
before the world was made. Now let's pause there and assess what we've covered so far. In Jesus' prayer, what's the main thing that he's talking about? Father, I want to bring you glory. Glorify yourself. Glorify me with the glory that I had in the beginning so that I may bring glory to you. And that's why a lot of scholars call this second half of John's gospel the book of glory, because this is the hour of his glory, the hour of his crucifixion. So that's the main thing that he's praying for. That's his earnest prayer above all others, is that God may be glorified. Not, Father, keep me safe. Not, Father, prosper our missionary work. But rather, Father, glorify your name. So we pick up in verse 6. I have manifested thy name to the men thou gavest me out of the world. Sort of like my missionary ventures are completed. Thine they were, and thou gavest them to me, and, I, and they have kept thy word. Now they know everything that thou hast given me is from thee, for I have given them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from thee, and have believed that thou didst send me. So he's kind of like, in his prayer, he's reaching in and, and grabbing his buddies and bringing them in close and incorporating them into his own petition because he has prayed for himself, Father, glorify me that I may bring glory to you. And now he's kind of bringing his buddies in close and bringing them into that petition. May they glorify you as well. Let's see, verse 9. <clears throat> I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom thou hast given me, for they are thine. All mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to thee. So we get the first hint of this is a goodbye. Holy Father, keep them in my name, in thy name, which thou hast given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. So that's the first kind of hint of danger that we get. What is the problem that will come their way? What do you want God to protect them from? We want God's protection for the disciples mostly from themselves, their inner struggles, turmoils, temptations, the things that would pull them apart. That's going to be their toughest thing to guard against, is being pulled apart. And that makes sense because Jesus talks about um, pulling from the Old Testament, strike the shepherd so that the sheep may be scattered. Well, he knows he, the shepherd, is about to be struck. And so the first thing on his mind as a good shepherd is, Father, don't let the sheep be scattered. Keep them together. Verse 12, while I was with them, I kept them in thy name, which thou hast given me. I have guarded them, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So there's an acknowledgement that one is lost, Judas is lost. Now I'm coming to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. So in other words, I think he's saying, I want them to be able to perceive the goodness that will come out of all this, what looks like horrible tragedy and defeat and loss. I want them to see the victory that is, will become clear in hindsight and that vision will sustain them through these tough times. Verse 14, I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I don't pray that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And the world here represents, as it most often does, sort of the forces arrayed against God, the corruption of the world. Verse 17, sanctify them in the truth, thy word is truth. So the reality of the situation, the reality of God's truth will make them holy, will make them belong more intensely to God. As thou didst send me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, set myself apart, that they also may be set apart, consecrated in truth. So he's, he's reached in for his close disciples, the twelve. But then he goes on in verse 20. I do not pray for these only. So he's extending his reach even further now. But also for those who believe in me 
through their word. And again, he sees the same danger, that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. The glory which thou hast given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, even as thou hast loved me. One thing, <coughs> excuse me, that I find very fascinating there is that um, verse 22, the glory which you gave me, I gave to them. So I'm bringing them close to me. I want you to sanctify them in the truth. Uh, I'm consecrating myself. I'm consecrating them. And my glory is passing on to them. So these apostles will share in my glory, not just in my work, but also in my glory. Verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom thou hast given me may be with me where I am, to behold my glory which thou hast given me in thy love for me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these know that thou hast sent me. I made known to them thy name, and I will make it known that the love which thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. And so this whole prayer traces over these connections of unity and bonding. Um, it's like, like pasting in glue, as it were, again and again, layer after layer, talking about how the Father is connected to the Son, and the Son is connected to the Father, and the Son is connected to these uh, close disciples, and, and through them to others who come to believe um, in their word, and so on. So it's a marvelous prayer, and it's a marvelous insight into the mind of Christ and into the heart of Christ and the things that are a burden on his heart and what he wants the Father to hear and understand and grant. Another great vision into uh, the heart of Jesus comes at Gethsemane. Um, so in Matthew 26, starting in verse 36, Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go yonder and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed. So interesting that he, he does very much like he does earlier, that he seeks out a solitary, lonely place, but this time he wants his closest friends with him. And he wants them to stay at a little bit of a distance for him to have that solitude, but he also wants them close at the same time. Almost, I would liken it to someone who is very sick in the hospital. And it's like part of you wants your friends and family close, and part of you just wants to be alone. You know, it's like you want, to, you want kind of both at the same time. And his prayer comes in verse 39. Uh, he fell on his face very humble, and prayed, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And then we know that he comes to the disciples and finds them sleeping and wakes them up, and they can't stay awake, and um, we go kind of back and forth on that until he's betrayed. Also, some of the prayers that we get at the cross, uh, Luke 23, 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. And then at, on, in all of the Gospels, I think, uh, at the sixth hour there was darkness until the ninth hour, and at the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, he's calling Elijah. Uh, because the, it's very similar. Eli is basically the beginning of Eliyah. Elijah, um, which, which means my, my God. So it makes sense that people think, oh, we must be calling for Elijah. And Elijah was very critical to the story of the second coming or of the coming of the Messiah. My pet theory about this, um, and I, I've been searching for some mention of it, um, but my pet theory is, is that 
because each of the Gospels is very specific. When does this happen? This happens at the ninth hour. And so my, my theory is, at the ninth hour, there's a, a prayer office, a Jewish prayer office, where you pray Psalm 22. And I think Jesus was trying to keep the habit of the obligation of praying that psalm at that hour. And it also just so happens that it really speaks to his situation and speaks to his anguish and so on. So I'm, I'm still looking for verification of that theory, but it's just my theory. But it really makes sense to me. And then uh, one final prayer from the cross. Uh, Jesus cries out with a loud voice, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. And when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, certainly this man was innocent. Well, we'll pause there. We might pick up with some of these others uh, and do uh, two sessions on prayers from the New Testament because we, we probably shouldn't leave any of this other uh, good, good nuggets of uh, information out. So we'll pick up next time with more on prayers from the New Testament. Thank you.